All right, Becca. Okay, we're back after technical difficulty. I understood that we were sideways before and that makes it a little difficult and it's not very comfortable. So look, um, what we were saying was we we're here to talk about SETI, actually the namesake endeavor of the SETI Institute, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, perhaps more accurately, the search for extraterrestrial technology that uh, might serve as a proxy for intelligence. It might be discovered in the form of radio signals coming from deep space from beyond our solar system. It might come in the form of flashes of light that we could detect, pulses of laser light that might be being used for communication. They might be being used for propulsion. So at the SETI Institute, we've been using the Allen Telescope Array since 2007 to search the skies for narrowband radio signals that would suggest the presence of technologies and advanced civilizations beyond our own solar system. But more recently, we've embarked on a different kind of program, and we've talked about it here on Facebook Live previously. It's a program we call Laser SETI, and it's a program to look at the entire night sky, all of the sky, all over the planet, all of the time. It's a program called Laser SETI, the all sky, all the time search for extraterrestrial intelligence through the flashes of laser light. So, we did an Indiegogo campaign a couple of months ago that was quite successful and helped us raise enough money to get this program off the ground, so to speak, and to start building the first observatories. You met Elliot Gillum, who's the SETI scientist whose project, uh, who's really leading that project for the SETI Institute, and we're going to go talk to him again and get an update. I'm Bill Diamond. I'm the CEO here at the SETI Institute. Welcome to our headquarters here in Mountain View, California. We're going to go back and uh, meet Lee, uh, sorry, with Lee and meet uh, Elliot and get an update on our laser SETI program and uh, see what's latest and happening on that front. This is a program that involves building and deploying telescopes or actually camera systems with lenses and, uh, and diffraction gratings on them that allow us to look for laser flashes, short-term bright pulses from the deep sky. And uh, the pro project's already underway. Some of the hardware has already been delivered. And uh, we're going to get an update from Elliot. So let's say hello to Elliot. Elliot. Hi there. Say hi to everybody. How are you? How are you doing, Facebook? All right. So um, I kind of reminded people after I discovered, first of all, something very uncomfortable. I was sideways. Yes. And uh, that was rather painful. But we what got that we told you about breaking the laws of physics? Well, you know, I mean, we're stretching the laws of physics every day. Why not be sideways? <laughs> it's a little bit zero G here at the SETI Institute. So, Elliot, um, give us an update on the laser SETI program, since we probably have some viewers who may not have been aware of the project that we talked about when you first appeared uh, on Facebook with us. And give an overview of what the project is all about, and then maybe you can give us an update on, on where it stands right now. Sure, yeah. So, for people who um, didn't get, get the material in the Indiegogo campaign we just finished, um, we started the project about two years ago mm -hmm. with the idea of doing an all-sky survey, something that had never been done before uh, in optical, visible light. And so we went through a lot of theory and design. We built a prototype of one idea. Uh, we tried some other things, and, and we actually ended up going with our second prototype. So what you can see sort of complexly behind me okay. uh, on the screen. Uh, did a bunch of testing to show that we think that that works, and then we did the Indiegogo campaign in order to raise money, the cameras are rather pricey. Yeah, so we, we, we need a lot of them. Yeah, well, to, <laughs> to, yeah, we need uh, about a hundred for the whole world. Right. Um, but we had one, and we needed more than that in order to be able to prove the system out. Right. Uh, we've we've done as much observation as we can do with one camera. We've now received a second camera, mm -hmm. and two more are due any day, uh, and that's that's enough to do one field of view. Okay. And prove out not just the instrument false positives, but our ability to discard those false positives uh, by looking across all of the instruments simultaneously as we observe the same part of the sky. In an automatic fashion, I mean, this is a 
oh, computer, yes. <laughs> compute heavy capabilities, not like people having to say, well, that was a laser pulse, that was an airplane. Yeah, so <laughs> each camera is dumping out hundreds of megabytes per second of data. Right. And then it's one, one CPU that's able to keep up with all the data, figure out if there's something there, figure out if it matches what we're looking for, yep. and very quickly decide whether we're interested in it or not. Okay, so before we get an update on the, some of the hardware and where things are, maybe go back a little bit uh, for some of the folks again and explain what, what are the merits of looking for laser pulses anyway? What, where did that idea come from? Why would we look for them and, and does it even make sense? Well, it goes back to the invention of the laser. Uh, it was recognized that because light can be focused so much more narrowly than radio signals because the wavelength is shorter, that because that's that's part of why we use it for everything we do today. I mean, the, the, the internet, <laughs> CDs, the, the, fiber optics. Everything is, is really driven by fiber optics and by yeah. optical communications. Uh, even NASA, I think, has run a gigabit communication link between here and the moon, and I think that was only a, a 500 milliwatt laser. Mm -hmm. You know, not that much stronger than a laser pointer. Yeah. Yep. Um, light is incredibly useful in so many different ways: manufacturing, communications, so on. So it was suggested that light could be used to communicate over interstellar distances. Now maybe that would be somebody intentionally signaling us, which I call the beacon. Right. Uh, it could be someone passing through somebody's communication beam, mm -hmm. interception. Uh, one of the most interesting ideas, I think, uh, is uh, been being developed by Breakthrough Starshot, the idea of using beamed energy, whether radio or optical, uh, right. to, to generate uh, basically a, an artificial solar sail mm -hmm. that you can accelerate a spacecraft to very high speeds because the hard thing about rockets is you have to bring your fuel that you're we gonna do. accelerate here. <laughs> right. And so it's this quadratic problem of however fast you wanna go, you need way more fuel than that. And so the faster you want to go, the more uh, practical these alternatives that don't require you to bring your fuel with you are. So you're basically using the photon as a source of pressure against yep. a sail. And in fact, the Kepler Space Telescope is doing this right now. I mean, they keep that telescope now in position using the three-sided uh, solar panel to make up for the fact that they lost reaction wheels uh, on that spacecraft and had to change the way the mission is carried out. But they're using the sun's radiation pressure and they're using the solar panels like a sail, and they're keeping that spacecraft oriented just the way they want it. So it's not, a, it's not as though this is an idea that hasn't been uh, tried or tested yet. That's the, it's, it's done in space. The Planetary Society has tested a solar sail. They have scales on the Earth so accurate that you can shine a light on it, and the scale can actually measure the radiation so you can pressure. really feel the radiation pressure. Yeah. It's, it's a very well understood phenomenon. And so if you, if you take an incredibly bright laser, you can start to accelerate a craft to very high speeds. Now, but when um, you do that, what you're going to do is illuminate more than the, because you wouldn't want any part of the sail not to be illuminated. So you're going to flood it. So yeah, you're going to go around it. And so if we were to see that kind of signal, I would expect it as it as it you're shoot you're shooting your laser at your spacecraft. You're on a planet that's moving, something that's orbiting. Maybe it's a spacecraft or a space station. Who knows? But you've got two things moving in space. So you've got this rotating uh, beam, and so you'd expect to see one pulse from the from one side of the the overspill, and then a pulse from the other side of the overspill. So you'd actually see a physical spatial uh, separation between those That's beams, at least in principle. Yeah, there should be a time separation. Yeah, uh, and this is a project, uh, again, um, Elliot mentioned the Breakthrough, Breakthrough Prize Foundation, their program Starshot, which in a few decades plans to accelerate very tiny um, chips with very large, thin sails uh, at 10 or 20% the speed of light off towards Alpha Centauri using laser propulsion. Yeah. And that's well, um, not too far in the future in the grand scheme of things. Well, we're outer space newbies, and so <laughs> it, it's going to be an incredible achievement if we pull it off to accelerate a one gram spacecraft to a, to a fraction of the speed of light. But it's not hard to imagine that uh, a society that's a thousand years more advanced than us might be able to dump a whole lot more power into a much larger spacecraft right. that could be seen potentially across the known universe depending sure. on the size of the spacecraft and the amount of energy they were able to store up and dump into that beam. Well, not far from here at the Lawrence Livermore Labs uh, is the world's most powerful laser. Uh, it's used for studying nuclear phenomena, um, particularly nuclear uh, fusion. But um, my understanding is if you take, took the output of that laser, if you took the light output of that laser and coupled it with one of our existing telescope mirrors, like the eight-meter telescopes in Hawaii or Chile, and shined it off into space, it would be brighter than the sun by about 10,000 times. 
That's but I think that answers the question that people might have, like, well, could you see a laser, um, you know, that, against that's a, a star? That's independent of distance. Independent of distance, right, because of the coherence of the beam. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. All right, so, so it's not a crazy idea to go look for it, but like you said, if somebody was trying to message us, it probably wouldn't be just us. They might, like a beacon, be kind of shining this in different places at different times. So in order to see, have any chance of seeing that, what do you want to do? You want to look... Well, all the time and, and all the sky. All the sky. That's the thing is the the bigger an antenna you build, whether in the radio or in the optical and mirrors in the optical we call mm -hmm. or antennas in the optical we call mirrors. Yeah. But the bigger you build it, the more it tends to have a narrow field of view because it you can't build it. You have so much curvature required to have a wide field of view. Right. Just like the that's why the Allen telescope array was designed with many small dishes yes, because that allows its field of view to stay large mm -hmm. and then you just you, you combine with it then with interferometry mm -hmm. we're not doing interferometry but again we we want this wide field of view for cost efficiency and, and practicality and cover the whole sky since we don't know where it might come from yep. it might come from the galactic plane it might come from somewhere 100 light years away we don't we don't know right um, and we also don't know when it might show up mm -hmm. they might have been pinging us every thousand years for the last million years or <laughs> we maybe the signal is going to arrive tomorrow and we just don't know right and so the best option is to just look everywhere all the time and that's an advantage we have in the optical domain that is much more costly I guess it's fair to say in the uh, radio domain that if you you know it's kind of impractical to think of being able to truly cover the sky with radio telescopes devoted to doing you know SETI kind of work but here although you mentioned the cameras are you know, not inexpensive. I mean, they're not the multi-million dollar uh, range of, of individual radio telescopes. So we actually have an opportunity here to deploy a system around the world. First time ever. That first wasn't ever. that wasn't what they thought 20 years ago. They thought radio would get there first. Yeah. But uh, compute power is still pretty expensive, and it's a question of the the sensitivity amount of signals you have to process. But the, in optical, we can do it very efficiently. All right. Well, those who saw the Facebook Live with uh with you actually before we launched the Indiegogo campaign, saw the actual camera that you have, and there's a smaller model of it here, and some graphic pictures, uh, CAD drawings of it there. Tell us a little bit about the uh, the camera system and the observatories you're planning to build. Well, <clears throat> do you mean about the camera itself? or Start with the camera, and okay. then maybe the observatories. Of course, I know we've built a camera before and are building more now, but also the observatories and how they work. Okay, um, so let me try. This wasn't really meant to show the camera. This is actually the engineering system I'm using to to create the enclosure for the cameras. Mm -hmm. There's two cameras per enclosure because we have one camera this way and one camera turned 90 degrees that way because of the special CCD readout technique we use. Okay. It causes us to lose one axis of information, but we also want the extra spectra, and so two cameras per field of view works out great for that. So we need an enclosure because this thing is like any telescope is going to be sitting outside all the time. Yeah, I was going to say, you can't <laughs> observe all this, this guy all the time. And, uh, can't yeah. do it from your bedroom. So, uh, I don't know, can you see the mouse on the screen or should I, should I just point with my, my hand? I think I'll, so we stand up here and maybe I'll shift the camera to be a little more visible. There we go. So the camera is actually sitting down here and it sits in this mount. This is a 3D printed mount. And then this is just a cylinder as an approximation for a lens which focuses the light into the focal plane here. And then what hides inside here is a transmission grating. And that's kind of where the magic happens, where we break, we split the light into its component colors. Just like, like Newton, a prism. Like a Newton, New, mm -hmm. Newton did with the prism. Yeah. With the, um, and so, and this is just a, a lens hood designed to, to eliminate any stray light that's not in the field of view. And this is all very tight and elegant because it's all 3D printed and so we can create exactly the structure we need to keep it minimal and, and cheap and rigid. Uh, I already talked about why we have two of them. Uh, just to s sort of explain the rest of the diagram here briefly, there's a shutter, which is in addition to the camera shutter okay. that we, we have to close during the day because we don't want the sun we'll sh to, protect the to shine in. And this lens would basically melt the, the shutter in the camera here. Right, right. This is a very expensive camera. We don't want to be burning those out. Mm -hmm. If we melt the shutter, then we can burn the CCD, and that's really expensive. So you have a mechanical shutter really at the top of the mm -hmm. optics, and then you have, of course, the camera's own shutter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then um, I won't get into too many details. Some support electronics. This is our air filter so that we can exchange heat and air with the outside yep. without getting junk in here. This is actually a really nice filter. It's a medical 
uh, quality but industrial grade strength so we can put it outside. A little bit more I can explain about that later. But then, the, you want me to explain how the camera works? Yeah, maybe I give an overview of how the camera uh, works and operates and can, say, differentiate a laser pulse, which we're looking for, from, say, a, an airplane or satellite or yeah. some other passing interference. So the, the, the two main techniques are how we read out the CCD and what we do to the light before it gets to the CCD mm -hmm. with the transmission grading. So probably the best way to see it is over here. The transmission grading is optimized to split the light into uh, the, the first and negative first spectral orders. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see the zeroth in the center there, and then the plus minus one spectral order. So this, this is of the sky, so everything you're seeing here is a star. So the star gets basically smeared into three points of light, yeah. uh, basically those first order uh, basically diffraction points and then the, the, the yeah. zero. So some, some passes straight through. Mm -hmm. Um, and then most of it goes through the plus and minus one. Mm -hmm. The transmission grading actually, uh, in the, the brightest part, part of the visible okay. spectrum, is able to null out the zeroth order. And so there's actually a correlation between the frequency we're observing uh, that we think we saw mm -hmm. and how much, what the ratio between that is and the zeroth order. It's a nice check on the signal being what we think it is. And you can see some are very bright and you end up seeing other spectral orders and it smears out. Mm -hmm. um, and this is kind of the mess of a star field. This isn't even what the camera processes, however, because this is a 10 second integration. We use this sort of image for what's called registration, yep. know, knowing where we're looking on the sky. Yeah. But the way the camera actually reads this stuff out is in this case, this way, mm -hmm. and it, it basically, it smears it down very quickly. And so it's a imaging technique that's used for manufacturing or satellite imagery when you're flying over the earth and you want to you've got a moving target, we're actually just using it to get time resolution. Okay. Because we think we, we don't know whether the signal we're looking for is a nanosecond or a, a second. Right. That's, that's a difference in a, a fa by a factor of a billion. Mm -hmm. And so we think a millisecond is a pretty good time resolution to have, and that's how fast we can clock out the so the millisecond the would be the duration of a pulse, for example, that we could detect. Well, we can, we can detect a nanosecond pulse. Mm -hmm. It will just show up within a given millisecond. Okay. It just has to be bright enough to, to the only thing is if it's longer than a millisecond, then it starts to smear out vertically. Mm -hmm. And so the, the image processing algorithm that reads this has to be aware of that. And so what we look for is for two things. If, if, we, if we were to see a signal, say up here again in this star, this is, these are broadband sources. Stars radiate across the full optical wavelength. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we would see two dots according to the, and the separation would be larger if it was red and shorter if it was blue. Oh, so it would be either outside or inside those first yeah, inside order the, this, bands. These, these bands, because this, this represents the full spectral resolution. Okay. And so we'd see two little point dots, and we might see a dot in the center depending on whether it was uh, nulled out by the, the zeroth order or not. Okay. And so then it, we'd see it if it lasted for more than a millisecond. Let's say it lasted for uh, 100 milliseconds. We'd see 100 pixels of a, of a smear. Mm -hmm and we, the image processing has to be able to deal with that. And that actually looks a lot like airplane strobes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But the nice thing is airplanes don't move at the right rate, mm -hmm. and they're also broader band, and they have other components that we can use to throw them out. So the com computer algorithm algorithms would allow us to differentiate, say, a blinking airplane mm -hmm. light as it's passing by, or a satellite uh, that's passing overhead, yep. reflecting light, et cetera. Okay. They already do, because Airplanes want to move in the sky, and the right. stars move at a very defined rate, mm -hmm. and so it's easy to throw out anything that doesn't move at that rate. Okay, fantastic. And uh, so the uh, the signal here, based uh, we, does the system allow you to know what wavelength you are detecting at that point? Mm -hmm. So you could tell it if it's be. red or blue, or based yeah. on its position in that in that uh, uh, grading path. And then, like I say, we can we can check that against the zeroth order. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so, why then do you need, oh, so, or how many cameras do you need at a given location to serve the function? And why do you need that number? What's going on with each yeah. observatory? So, what you have in any sensitive instrument is noise. Mm -hmm. And so, about once every thirty hours, uh, actually, way more often, you'll see noise in the CCD. And that's radioactive decay somewhere in the optical path. That's a cosmic ray coming through. There's, 
it, it doesn't even matter whether you're whether you've got the shutter of the camera open or not. Mm -hmm. You see the same noise rate. Ah, interesting. Okay. Uh, and once in a long time, one of those uh, looks like a, like a point source. Mm -hmm. And then, once in a long time, you get one in a pair that could be the right distance because if if you get I mean if you get a giant squiggle, you can throw that away instantly. If you get a dot. But there's no nothing matching. Like there's a tiny little dot there on its own. Then doesn't you know that's not what you're looking for. Right. But statistically, that dot could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so the math works out that once about every day, you'll get two dots that look like they could be a candidate. Mm -hmm. And that's just with one camera. Uh -huh. So because we already have the second camera, because we're smearing it out, we lose one axis. So we rotate the other one, and we can combine the events in order to figure out the space spatial position and the mm -hmm. time of the event. Uh, but that also, instead of two spectra, gives us four spectra. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. That's if you if you knew you were looking for something already at that spot mm -hmm. or at that time, then you'd be pretty convinced that 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 was what you were looking for. But with a transient signal, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll quote Carl Sagan: uh, "Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence." True. You know, if we're <laughs> if we're going to say we're gonna say we've got them, we saw you know two millisecond flashes that like could be a beamed energy propulsion system that swept across the earth, Right. Uh, we better be able to really st stand on our evidence and, and say this was not some random flash, this wasn't coincidence, this couldn't been, have been gamed by something else, yeah. this wasn't just some you know, college student on a mountaintop with a laser pointer, you know, like, there's all sorts of things that we want to make sure that this, um, this wasn't in order to be able to say justify the claim that we think it might be. Right, right. Uh, and so what we do is we have two cameras and one field of view from one location, mm -hmm. and then we put another location looking at the same field of view with two more cameras. How far apart do these need to be? Well, in order to be able to measure the, since the time resolution is one millisecond, mm -hmm. um, if you, you want to be able to measure the, the propagation delay, then you want it at least about a thousand miles apart okay. just to be able to have good time resolution on that propagation delay according to how it, the signal arrived. Mm -hmm. um, you, the other constraint really is the minimal number of observatories to cover the world. Uh, we have a field of view, the instrument is about 75 degrees across. Mm -hmm. Four of them gives us pretty good coverage for 120 degrees, meaning down to 30 degrees above the horizon. So for any given location, we can cover more or less the whole sky down to about 30 degrees above yeah. the horizon. And you don't want to go much below that anyway, mm -hmm. because there's a lot more light pollution and there's a lot more extinction, because you're looking through a lot more air to get out right. from the Earth that way. Okay, so we can get this very wide cone yeah. from any given location. So if you wanted to cover the sky once, you would need three observatories per hemisphere, three mm -hmm. times 120, and then so that's six. But since we want to have uh, a lot of confidence, and the other thing is when you're trying to look all the time, no site is perfect, you're going to have inclement weather. Sure. So that extra isolated weather a thousand miles away means mm -hmm. you'll, you'll get more data. Another data point. Um, so that means you want about 12 observatories to cover the world. And so each observatory would have how many cameras? Would have eight. Eight cameras. Okay. Yeah. In, in four of the enclosures. Uh, and with the Indiegogo the campaign, uh, we raised enough money to build the first four cameras, is that right? Or, or eight cameras? So actually, um, something that we, you'll be hearing first today is that we, we raised enough money uh, through donations uh, in addition to the campaign because of the campaign, but mm -hmm. outside of the campaign system, uh, we're going to, instead of four cameras, meaning one field of view from, from two sites, we raised enough for eight cameras, which means Fantastic. two fields of view mm -hmm. from two sites. Mm -hmm. And that's really excellent because because we're still testing this system, you wouldn't want to go by all 100. Sure. That'd be foolish. What if something was wrong and there's some, some other noise source we didn't account for? Mm -hmm. um, but two fields of view means that if we see something weird in one field of view, then we can say, well, after we observe for a while, do we see it over there? Or is this field of view weird? Or, mm -hmm. And so it really gives us sort of a good minimum and maximum scientific and engineering basis to prove the system out. Okay. And is there um, software development required as well, or is the software pretty well written, at least for the image processing, perhaps not for camera control and enclosure data, but, but uh, yes. imaging? So the, the, the core instrument processing is done mm -hmm. and works with the data we have. We want to gather more data. Uh, right now we have to take the camera out every night in order to take data. Mm -hmm. And so once we have these things running, we'll have a lot more data to test the camera on. 
but then the other things we have to do are, are sort of the observatory block and tackle of like, okay, what time do we open and close the shutters? We know, how do I upload data to the cloud and say, here's what I found for the night? Right. Um, those sorts of things. So it's, it's not the science part, but mostly the engineering that, that hasn't been done there. Hasn't been done there, okay. And um, I, I think part of the goal here as well is to give uh, the general public or the curious general public with, with interest and tools access to the data so they can actually also look at it and uh, yeah. mess around a bit? So the raw data rate is enormous. It's too big, yeah. Right. Uh, you, you'd, you'd be chucking out hard drives, you know, every, what, minute? <laughs> full full big terabyte good. hard drives, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep some amount of raw data just because it's good to have and, and be able to do statistical analyses of and that sort of stuff. Right. But the way the imaging pipeline works is we have different levels of candidates. You know, is it a signal above the noise? Is it is it point source shaped? Is it you know paired with something else? It has and to so, meet a, a series of yeah. criteria before we get really interested. And those increasingly stringent tests each have sampling percentages associated with them, mm -hmm. and that's all going to be calibrated based on how often they happen and how much we really want to look at it. Anything that gets you know pretty high up is probably going to be sampled at 100 percent. Yeah. And that means we'll be able to look at anything that's interesting, and that data should actually be relatively small. Yeah. Well, it's like so many branches of science now, which is why we're trying to apply tools like machine learning to do data analytics, because there's more data being generated than we can possibly process. So a very 